，我现在又讲的是蔡佳颖，她现在是台北啊、呃、北一女的那个是 AI Club 对不对 ？AI Club 的主席，然后她在奥一科技实习了一年。他现在要，他在，他今天要分享他在一年当中把 AI 应用在啊、呃、Cyber Threat Analysis 上面的一些经验。那请我们大家以最热烈的掌声来欢迎，谢谢。Hey, um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I'll be sharing this talk in English. So I am Chayan Tai, or you can just call me Jacqueline. And in today's talk, I'll be sharing my high school intern project. Which is constructing an AI helper for cyber threat intelligence analysis. And during the talk, I will introduce like several common and useful NLP tools, and also share my perspectives as a high school intern. So first, I would like to give a brief self introduction.、Um, I'm a, currently a rising senior in Taipei First Girls High School, which just means I'm about to like start my last year in high school. And at school, I'm also the artificial intelligence club president, and I've also been an intern in Cycraft, which is all you do here, Koji. And basically, we're just a cybersecurity startup, and I've been interning there for one year. So before like talking about like my、um, intern project, I'd like to first share like my perspectives and reflections as a high school intern, which hopefully can encourage more high school and college students to participate in interns. So first is actively reaching out, and the reason I wish to give this advice to、um, students traces back to the time when I started my high school intern journey. So during last year summer,、um, I was very had I had the opportunity to bring my AI club to Cycraft and to have like a tech company visit. And the picture on the top left corner is the picture we took during our visit. And during the、um, the visit process, I observed there were like other interns participating in a Um, cybersecurity competition called Capture the Flag, and at that time I thought that that was so cool for me because I've never actually exposed myself to cybersecurity ever before. So then I told them that I really wanted to have like an intern opportunity, and after like giving my resume and having some interviews, I was very fortunate to be interning here for one year. So I hope this kind of example can encourage. Um, more high school or college students here to actively pursue their dreams in technology or programming. And the next one I would like to talk about is、um, knowing what you want. Because during my intern, I was often asked by my like peers and teachers, like they would ask me, like, how do you really manage like schoolwork, your clubs, and intern all these activities at the same time? And at first, you know, I just gave us those old replies, like. Self-discipline and determination is what made me manage so many things at the same time. But the more I thought about it, I realized that these answers all trace back to、um, one sentence, which is just knowing your goals.、Um, an actual example I had is that、um, during、um, there was a time when I had to decide between intern and the programming training in our school, and I knew that at the time instead of like just practicing like common. Um, coding competition problems. What I really want is like practical machine learning implementation, and also、um, I wanted to have like an actual NLP project where I can demonstrate to a lot of people. So I, in the end, I decided to continue my intern during the year, and I think during the process, my ability has significantly increased, and also I've learned a lot of cybersecurity knowledge along the way. So I would like to encourage like more high school and college students. If like you're trying to hesitating between like what should I do? Should I do some research or should I do like any kind of project? Maybe you can try to first think about like what do you really want to achieve during your high school or college years. And the two、um, use and implement and problem finding and solving are the two、um, kind of gains that I think that I achieve most aside for all the machine learning and. Um, NLP technology that I get got from my intern. So first is use and implement. So during、um, use, the use and implement is one of the things that I think I learned most during my intern years. Because for us high school students who want to learn more about AI or machine learning, whether we try to learn it from school or from other like. Sites like online sites, we could only get like only like abstract concept, but there was no actual implementation. It was not until during my intern that I was able to actually construct an NLP project and actually implement all the NLP tools I've learned. 
And I think this really helped me a lot during the process. And the other one is problem finding and solving. And problem finding is not just like in common coding competitions, like just finding the bugs in code, but also trying to like cons consistently optimize your code. And I think um, the intern, ha intern year has really helped me a lot in elevating my abilities. And the other problem solving, I will talk more about it during when I'm introducing my project. And this is another activity I participated during my intern. It is called the IT Home Cybersecurity Exhibition, which is um, la and last month in August. And this is the first time I participated in the exhibition, not as a um, visitor or not as a not as a visitor, but actually I was there at the booth, at our cybersecurity booth, and actually introducing to the visitors about um, cybersecurity knowledge and teaching them how to play our cybersecurity um, game. And this is the picture that we took together uh, of all of the interns. And this is me at the booth, like trying to teach like a lot of visitors about the cybersecurity knowledge. And I think this kind of experience is really hard for me to get if I just only participated in a research or in any kind of competition. This is something I really want to share to all students. Okay, now I'll go straight right into our project goal. And, and for our um, AI helper in cyber threat intelligence um, analysis, there are three main project goals. Now let's talk about the first one. Which is classifying articles from the largest Chinese security website. So our purpose for this project goal is that we wish to help the security team to quickly identify the articles related to their daily missions. So our data source for this project goal is Freebuff. And I don't know if anyone has heard of, about Freebuff before, but Freebuff is actually the most prestigious cybersecurity website in the Asia region. And it has a lot of rich and up-to-date, simplified Chinese cybersecurity articles and information. And due to time constraints, so I'm also, I only picked like two of the most prevalent cybersecurity topics for this project, which is vulnerabilities, low dong, and also enterprise security, tie, tie anquan. And for vulnerabilities articles, it's more about like the actual, how like businesses actually discover the vulnerabilities and how they actually use actual imp implementation details to actually detect these vulnerabilities. As for enterprise security articles, it's mostly about like introducing like what kind of threats are there to different enterprises and how enterprises tackle the problems. So there are mainly four small procedures for our first goal, which is determining whether a cybersecurity article actually belongs to um, vulnerabilities category or the enterprise security category. So the first step in our first goal is to for data crawling. So since during my intern process, I really wanted a, an opportunity where I can start, learn, start my learning from the basic data crawling. So for this process, I actually constructed my own Python crawler. And in order to construct my own Python crawler, I actually consulted the Freebuff source code, which is shown at the left side over there. And I tried to look for a pattern to help me decide um, how to achieve, achieve the links for each cybersecurity article. So I found a pattern and I collected, collected the article links together and I started extracting each news article through each article link. And this process, although it seems very easy and easy to understand, but it's actually very difficult for me. For the first thing is that it's because the free buff source code is really, really complicated. Um, the, thing, the source code I demonstrated on the left is actually, after a lot of simplifications of the source code, is actually, the previous source code is actually very complicated. So it was very hard for me to find the pattern of each um, article link and try to find, write a Python rule to actually extract these article links. But there was one difficult thing about my crawling process, and the other difficulty I encountered is that um, after I crawled the website too often, I was often denied access into the free buff because they may think I, I'm kind of like a hacker or something into their website. So there, I have to be denied access for a lot of time, so I have to wait very long, and the process is very time consuming. So after like, getting all the text from the free buff website, the next step would be data processing because 
Um, the original data may have like a lot of unimportant, so unimportant information, so I have to sort of filter it. So there are mainly two stages in my data processing. The first one is tokenizing. Tokenizing is, just means that I put like a large article as an input, and I cut them to meaningful words and phrases. So I can use, so this um, my NLP model can use these words and phrases as a specific keywords to determine the classification. And the other stage I have is removing stop words. And stop words are basically words that are very common in general. That are, they are so meaningless that they interfere with the classification results. For example, like common conjunctions like uh, 可是因为而且, those kinds of conjunctions that don't really help us in classifying the articles. So the tool I used for tokenizing is the Jieba Chinese Tokenizing Library. Because as I mentioned, the Freebuff is full of like simplified Chinese cybersecurity articles. And Jieba is a really good tool for classifying, I mean, for tokenizing um, simplified Chinese articles. And the 40, as for the stop words, I used a simplified Chinese stop word list from a Chinese university. And not only this, it has like a lot of conjunctions, but I also included some common technical terms in the cybersecurity articles, because since we're dealing with like classifications with cybersecurity articles, I must include some of these common technical terms because they also don't really help with the um, classification as well. Some common terms are like um, 代码, 项目, 信息. Like these terms often occur in a lot of cybersecurity articles, but they don't really help us in understanding the classification. So then we'll move on to the data pipeline. And our data pipeline is consisted of mainly three NLP models. The first one is called count vectorizer. And the basic function of count vectorizer is that it converts a text document into a matrix of word counts. So in the example below, like for example, if I had like three really wordy articles and I really wanted to convert it into this kind of matrix where it shows like what, what, how often each term occurred in each article. So what count vectorizer does is that it converts this wordy article into this matrix that helps the NLP models understand better. So the purpose I used count vectorizer as my first NLP model is that I wish to use this count vectorizer result as the input data of the TF-IDF, which is the next NLP model I will introduce. Okay, so our next NLP model is TF-IDF. And its function is that it evaluates an importance of a word to a file in the file set. So the actual um, calculation of TF-IDF is shown over here at the bottom right corner, but its basic principle is that the word importance increases the more it appears in the file, but the word importance decreases if the word exists in many files. Because if a word exists like in a lot of files, then usually it means that this kind of word is really general and common, and it doesn't really help us in understanding like, what kind of type the article belongs to. So that's why we have to um, sort of degrade the word importance if it's very general or common. And the purpose we use TF-IDF because we wanted to let um, the later on classification model identify the important word tokens and use them as a classification basis rather than using like the common and general words that don't really help us a lot. So I would like to give like a really simple example to show how TF-IDF actually determines the word importance. So for example, I have two documents. The first document says um, the sky is blue, and the second document says the sky is not blue. And since um, both articles contain the sky is blue, then the word not is especially important in helping us determine which, which article like the words belong to. So in the TF-IDF calculation, TF representing term frequency and IDF representing inverse document frequency, we can, we can tell that the word not, actually the word importance here is much larger than all of the other words because it's relatively important for us to determine which um, type the article belongs to. So I'll like also share about like the advantages and drawbacks of the TF-IDF transformer. 
Like I mentioned, the TFID of Transformer is very simple implementation, and it is, very, it is also very easy to understand. Moreover, it can also help us filter out some common and irrelevant words during the process. However, its drawbacks is also a very crucial disadvantage of this transformer, TFIDF transformer, is that TFIDF cannot actually reflect the position information of the word. Uh, what does it mean by that? It means that, for example, if I have a word that appears in a word document title, or if it appears in the beginning or at the end of the article, then usually it means that it should be more important, right? But however, TFIDF cannot um, capture the word's position in evaluating the word's importance. And the last, um, but last most important um, NLP model I used for the data pipeline is called the SGD classifier. And this, it is the base main NLP model I use to help, uh, help me determine whether this article belongs to vulnerabilities or whether it belongs to um, enterprise security. So the function of NLP, I mean, um, stochastic gradient descent is that it linearly divides many different types of data into different categories, as shown at the, as this example visualized demonstration on the right here. So each data point would represent a single article, and what SGD does is that it tries to find these kind of boundaries and to tell which classification um, this article belongs to. And the purpose, of course, for this stochastic gradient descent is to help us classify between vulnerabilities and enterprise security. And its feature is that it only picks one sample for each step in determining classification boundary. So it's very efficient. And I would like to give like a, an easy example to show how um, stochastic gradient descent is much more efficient than the traditional gradient descent. So let's just assume, make it a simple example, is that we're trying to find the line of regression between weight and height. So we have a weight as an input, and we're trying to get a predicted height as our output, which means that we actually have to know the slope and intercept for our line of regression. So stochastic gradient descent would randomly pick one sample for each step and use it to calculate the derivatives for intercept and for slope. However, in like traditional gradient descent, we will have to plug in all of the data points with just these three data and calculate three times for each intercept and each slope. So it would be very time consuming. And in comparison, SGD classifier would be much more efficient in determining the line of, line of boundaries during the classification process. So the advantages of SGD classifier is that, of course, it's very efficient and computationally fast. However, its drawback is that it's very computationally expensive because every time I have to determine, in, determine the classification boundaries, I would have to use all of my computer's resources to process only one single training sample at a time. So it's very computationally expensive. And the last part is evaluation. After like, so many introduction about an LP model, it's time to like, have a sort of visualized demonstration of my actual results. So um, a, a matrix for the um, precision of vulnerabilities is enterprise security. Um, the precision I had for vulnerabilities articles is around 92%. And the precision I had for enterprise security articles is around 95%. Of course, words, um, numbers are really abstract to understand. So I actually provided like four examples of the actual classifications I um, constructed. So the first example is the second testing data. And this is, is an example of a correct classification I got after processing like the model in my Jupyter notebook. So in this article, its actual category in Freebuff is vulnerabilities. And, and the model has successfully predicted that this article is a vulnerabilities article as well. So there is not much problem with this article. However, for this 10th testing data, there were some problems that we got because it is a wrong classification. In Freebuff, this article actually belongs to vulnerabilities. However, what I predicted, 
is that this article is actually from enterprise security. And after so, I decided to like look more in depth into this article, and I found that found out that although this article mainly really talks about vulnerabilities, but there's a crucial word that appears very often in this article, and it's called Mage Card. So, um, Mage Card is actually a hacker group that um, tries to hack a lot of like personal information in financial corporations, and. And maybe it was because that it detected the word mage card that made it think that this may be to belong to the enterprise security. And the other really interesting example is that although Freebuff put this into the vulnerabilities, um, vulnerabilities category, but actually what I predicted is enterprise security. And this article, although it talks a lot about like vulnerabilities and how the Stuxnet worms actually tried to attack these vulnerabilities, but actually, it's but actually it's more of an introduction about how this Stuxnet Stuxnet worm actually intrudes enterprise security. So we think that actually, after consulting with a lot of cybersecurity professionals, we think that this article is more likely to belong in enterprise security rather than vulnerabilities. And due to time constraints, I'll skip the last example and move on to our second project goal which is setting up the recommendation system of prevalent cyber topics. So for this project goal, what I want to do is to, I want to pick top 10 cybersecurity topics, respectively for vulnerabilities and enterprise security articles. So what I use is um, single value decomposition, which is SVD for short. And its function is that it decomposes a complex count vectorizer matrix and, de and um, decomposes it to more small matrices. The reason I wanted to use SVD as, a, um, as my recommendation system comes from the inspiration from a Japanese research, which is animal clustering using SVD. So what this Japanese research does is that it collects a lot of animal-related articles and put them into the count vectorizer. And it uses the matrix that count vectorizer gained and put it into the SVD model. And what the Japanese research discovered from this SVD model is that from the subject vector, it contains a lot of matrix of different clusters based on inter-item similarities. For example, um, the, um, they found out that um, dog and cat are put together as a cluster, as a pet cluster. And the lion and tiger are put together as a wild and carnivorous cluster. And the bottom left corner is a Demonstra visualized demonstration of how SVD helps cluster the different inter-items. So after the Japanese example, I was thinking that what if we actually put our previous count vectorizer results into this SVD model? Will we be able to get like many clusters of different cybersecurity tokens as well? So I put a lot of my vulnerabilities article count vectorizer results into this SVD model and looked at the subject vector. And what we get is that PHP and JWT occurred very often in the top 10 vulnerabilities topics. And JWT is basically a user authentication method. And the reason that it appeared so often in the vulnerabilities um, topic is because that recently there are a lot of cyber criminals that found out this kind of authentication method actually contained a lot of flaws for them to attack. And PHP is just a common um, website programming code that, and because it's so popular that a lot of cybersecurity professionals actually discussed a lot of this programming language. And it's the reason why it's also appeared so often in vulnerabilities. And the next one is the clusters of enterprise security articles. So basically, I did the same thing with the enterprise security category, and I observed that financial corporations, mails, and CVE, these three tokens appear the most in enterprise security topics as well. And I'll like to, uh, since financial and corporations and mails are very common in enterprise security, I would like to talk about CVE. And CVE is, is basically a... Um, vulnerabilities on data set, and a lot of enterprise refer to this when they're being attacked by a lot of cyber criminal, criminals. And that's why it appeared so much in enterprise security topics as well. 
And lastly, I'll move on to my last project goal, which is recognizing attack techniques in articles and labeling them with MITRE attack techniques. So MITRE attack is basically a framework of adversarial tactics and techniques and procedures used by cyber criminals. And what the MITRE attack framework is so special is that it maps and indexes virtually everything regarding an intrusion for, from both the attack and defense sides. And our data source, because we're dealing with um, Chinese NLP analysis, we use Volhub, which is basically a translation of MITRE attack in, to simplify Chinese. And for our um, detection, we selected 26 most frequent and important attack methods that includes the attack uh, methods from all of these procedures. So the, this is the like a basic um, layout for how I try to use MITRE attack to detect, try to use MITRE attack techniques to deter detect attack descriptions in articles. The first is data crawling and processing. And since I've talked about this previously, I'd like to focus more on the labeling data. So our, for our data, we use like sentences from each MITRE attack description. And as for our labels, we use sequential indexes as the MITRE attack labels. And one thing that's very special about this is that we use non-attack descriptions uh, we used a specific tag for non-attack descriptions. And the reason we did this is that because during my process, I actually encountered a lot of generic statements. For example, like some of the MITRE attack descriptions would just tell me that, oh, you should really pay attention to this kind of attack method. And these kind of sentences don't really actually refer to a specific MITRE attack method. And actually it's very, it actually interfered a lot with my detecting procedure. So I decided for these like really generic statements, I would assign them a specific tag so my model would know not to look at these non-attack descriptions during my process. So basically I used three of the classifiers I learned during my intern process and put them into um, my uh, monitor attack detection model. So first I use SGD, and since I previously introduced it, I'll immediately move on to Naive Face, which is the second classifier I used. So this is the data pipeline I used for the Naive Face classifier. And Naive Face is basically like another kind of classifier that depends a lot about the token probabilities. So I use a more simple example, which is filtering spam mails as this example. So let's assume that we have a training data of normal and spam emails. And the um, frequency for normal emails is around 2 thirds, and for spam emails is around 1 thirds. And also, the um, frequency of each word token in each kind of um, email is also distri distributed on the left. And what Naive Base does is that if I, today I have an email that says free reminder, and Naive Base calculates the normal message score and spam message score to determine whether this article belongs to a normal score, normal email, or a spam email. So for calculating the score, it just multiplies like how often um, a type of um, email appears in the training data, and also multiplies how um, the probability of each word that appears in the normal email in order to calculate the normal message score. And the same idea goes for the spam message score as well. And through this example, we can tell that spam message score is much higher than the normal message score. So Naive Base would tell me then that this email is most likely to belong in the spam email. And however, Naive Base has a really significant drawback, is that it's the, called the zero conditional probability problem. Because for features, that have zero frequency, the total mass spam message score would result in zero. For example, today if my, in my training data, the word lunch never appeared in a spam message, message before, then if I today, I have a um, email that's called free lunch reminder, then my spam message score would be zero because of that um, zero probability. And as a result, although intuitively we can tell that this email actually belongs to the spam message, 
naive face would instead tell me that this email actually belongs to the normal message instead. So this is a, lot, this is a really significant problem that I faced a lot during my project because a lot of the, of the words I, um, I had in my testing data articles didn't really appear in my training data. So it resulted in that my, um, my, uh, my um, precision for a naive face is actually the lowest in, of all the three classifiers. And the last classifier we use is decision tree. And this is the overall data pipeline of decision tree consisting count factorizer, TFIDF, and the decision tree classifier. So the decision tree classifier is very easy to understand because it just uses the input data and asks the input data a lot of like yes no questions or conditional statements to determine whether the input data belongs to which category. So for example, if um, a doctor is trying to give a patient advice and uses the input data, it would first determine whether the patient is older than 40 years old and then it will determine its resting heart rate and it will determine how often this patient eats donuts. And through the decision tree process, we can tell that this patient needs to go easy on the donuts and get some exercise. And these green boxes actually represent the classification, mitre attack um, classification results in our project. So basically the advantage for a decision tree classifier is that it is very easy to understand and it's very versatile because you can use decision tree to solve a lot of business problems. However, its drawback is that it's very unstable and it requires a higher time to train the model. So moving on to our evaluation, the precision for each kind of classifier is demonstrated here and we can tell that of all all three classifiers, stochastic gradient descent actually performed best, which has an accuracy of 43.6%. And although 43.6% actually requires a lot of improvement, but it's much more, much better than the result of simply randomly guessing between the 26 mitre attack methods, which is only 3%. So actually, after the evaluation, I decided to put some of my free buff articles I previously crawled and put them into my SGD model to see how the results were, turn were turned out. Actually, I've prepared the video in case something went wrong to the internet, but actually what I did is that I used Flask to create this website, and I put, um, I put an article from rebuff into these, this uh, model. So the rebuff article I used is, called, is related to APT attacks. And what I did is that I just put them into this model and after I submit it, it will appear a lot of the mitre descriptions it detected from this article. So basically, this is the mitre attack description detection that, it, that this SGD classifier actually detected. And for each um, detection it detected, uh, it's that there will be a sentence that says, maybe the model says, oh, maybe this sentence actually belongs to a mitre attack. And it will predict the most likely type of mitre attack this sentence belongs to. And it will also show like the top three attack descriptions and the top three attack probabilities for this sentence. And I'll move on to um, a more um, accurate example is that in this article it talks about FTP upload PHP and it predicted it as a type for T1100. And since this is a mitre attack framework, T1100 actually um, refers to the web shell attack. So after determining that this um, sentence is a web shell attack, it also listed the top three um, attacks it thinks that this description belongs to, and also the top three attack probabilities. Okay. 
And in the end, a short conclusion for this is that for all three of my project goals, I only used very common and simple NLP models, and it was able to achieve a accuracy and precision that's much higher than the random guess or of the random guess procedure. And I would also like to really thank my intern mentors during the process for guiding me through the entire project. And thank you so much. And um, it's now the Q&A section. And if there are any questions in English or in Chinese, I would be happy to answer them. If you have any questions, you can ask Jain uh, uh, in private. Thank you. Let's, let's thank her again.